buenas noches, queridos amigos. Aquí de nuevo los saluda Janet Noltenius de Casa de la Cultura El Salvador. Es un placer estar con ustedes esta noche. And to say that this evening we have a treat. We have an absolute treat because we have Dr. Patrick Scallon with us. He uh, is a historian and he specializes in Latinx and Latin American history and the history of DC. Listen, you know, it is so important that somebody has been doing history of who we are in the United States and in Washington, DC. And Patrick has been the right person. He has interviewed at least a hundred Salvadorans, if not 500 Salvadorans, in order to, to do his doctoral thesis on the history of Salvadorans in the Washington, DC area. I, he is an archivist at the Smithsonian Latino Center uh, Latino DC History Project, and he currently leads as a researcher for curriculum on race and immigration at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American History. You know, this is so important, Patrick, because people don't realize that if we don't exist in institutions, as a group, as Latinos, we don't exist. And, you know, where are we going to be 50 years from now, 100 years from now, no? if we are not in institutions? And I think that your, your thesis and your research and what you're doing with Smithsonian to put us on the map that we exist is really a great contribution to our community here. Y eso yo te lo agradezco mucho porque eh, espero que logres hacer un libro de tu disertación doctoral eh, sobre los salvadoreños en Washington, D.C. Because it's important, you know, crazy people like you and me who love books and love to read and believe in history, we want to see that book. So I know it's going to take you some time but we really welcome that great contribution, Patrick, to our history. We thoroughly appreciate it. So welcome, Patrick. Welcome, welcome to Casa de la Cultura El Salvador. Adelante. Thank you so much, Dr. Nortenas. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here. And I, I'd have to say, let me start by saying I'm incredibly grateful to the Casa de la Cultura El Salvador for its um, work with the DC Latinx community, specifically Salvadorans. Uh, it's been really a pleasure to partake in the wealth of activities that Casa de la Cultura has done over the past several years. It's been really a pleasure to watch it grow and it is, <laughs> my hat is off, several hats are off to you and your team over the past few years to make this grow into just a really amazing uh, cultural phenomenon that has been able to celebrate both Salvadoran culture, Central American culture, and Latin American culture in the Washington DC area, which is um, much needed, I think, right? Bueno, much needed, and I'm delighted. And I want to say to everybody who was watching us that we really want questions in español or in English, en lo que se sientan cómodos, porque eh, parte de esto es el diálogo, y el diálogo ha sido muy importante para Patrick en el trabajo que ha estado haciendo y para nosotros también. Así es que eh, esperamos muchas, muchas preguntas de parte de ustedes, ¿verdad? Eh, y eh, 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 ya van a ver eh, cuando les presentemos aquí a Patrick que nos va a, um, a ver si logro hacer esto. <risa> aquí está. Okay. Hmm. No sé cómo está esto, pero eh, espero que esté hacer share screen. Ah, hoy sí. Ah, sí, sí. 
Ah, ¿qué tal? Así ah, sí. Aquí estamos. Ajá. Uh -huh. Y ahora te voy a poner a ti como eh, pin. All right. So it's only you that we're going to see. All right. Hopefully, if I can get myself disappeared. Oh, I'd much rather see you than see me. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, um, let's uh, let's see. There we go. All right. Now. Are we, can you see your, can you see the screen, Patrick? Uh, yes, one sec, now we're good, okay. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that I could see my notes as well as the screen. So I think we are all set to go. Okay, all right. Okay, uh, great. Well, uh, let's begin. I'd have to also say before we begin, I should say that uh, I have been tuning in quite regularly for the Dr. Hector Lindo Fuentes' presentations, which I am very grateful for the opportunity to be, to, to be on this side of the screen once. Um, I can't claim to match the good Dr. Lindo's eloquence, nor his Prezi presentations. I, mine are merely a PowerPoint, but hopefully someday I'll get to the point where I can match his eloquence with his Prezi. Um, we'll work on that. Give me, give me another a few months. Okay. Uh, like, like, like Dr. Lindo, Lindo, I'm a, I'm a historian of, of Latin America by training, as Dr. Noltenius mentioned. I focus on modern Central America, specifically El Salvador, and I've spent some time living, researching, and working in different parts of Central and South America, including La Uca, La Universidad Centroamericana, in Managua, Nicaragua, and in San Salvador, El Salvador. Right. So my connections are through the Yucca, both in El Salvador and Nicaragua, predominantly through the Jesuits, because I have been trained by the Jesuits for a good 18 years, both in high school, university, and graduate school. So, soy un producto de los Jesuitas. Uh, ay, 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 pero no eres Jesuita. No, no eres soy Jesuita, no, no, no. no. <laughs> Definitivamente no. So I've also lived in Washington, D.C. for the past 17 years, and all of them in the neighborhood that is known as Mount Pleasant, which some of you may be familiar with. And so during those 17 years, I've been very immersed in this community. Uh, I taught high school for many years in Washington, D.C., and I had a lot of Salvadoran students in the high school I taught. And my, my Salvadoran students would always ask me questions. They'd ask me questions about Salvadoran history, about migration, uh, about their families. And sometimes they'd tell me what their parents told them about kind of how they came to DC. Uh, and sometimes they asked me about how they came to DC because perhaps their parents weren't available to tell them or uh, you know, they wanted some a bit more in depth. Um, and I felt an obligation towards my students to help them navigate their histories. And so when I, when I did my doctoral thesis, which ideally will be a book, currently working on turning it into one. The past several years, and I felt an obligation towards my students to help them. Oh, now I'm getting feedback. Okay, we're good. Uh, I had an attempt to, I, I took an attempt to kind of, it was a, the doctoral thesis was an attempt to understand the international, the national and the local forces that resulted in this massive concentration of Salvadorans in the Washington DC metropolitan area. It was not only to understand how Salvadorans came, but the effect the impact of Salvadorans have had on both the city, Washington DC, and the greater metropolitan Washington area, right? The suburbs of Maryland and Virginia. And really to recognize the essential roles that Salvadorans have played in crafting the national capital region that many of us inhabit today. Because DC is only DC today because of the Salvadoran population, right? Yay. Absolutely, absolutely integral in building the DC, 21st century DC. Without Salvadorans, it would not have, it would not look this way. And it would not be, uh, it would be very different, right? And I don't think it would be nearly as, as fun or as, uh, I don't know, as, uh, um, as diverse uh, or as, I think, uh, rich as, as it is today. This study is not in any way an attempt to hell, tell a comprehensive history of Salvadorans in the D.C. area. That's not, the, that's not the purpose. What I seek to do is craft an engaging narrative 
that touches upon some of what I consider to be the more crucial elements of the history of Salvadorans in this area, right? So it's not, it's not an all-encompassing history, but there are some crucial elements I think really need to be told and haven't been told so far. And that's my goal is to be able to bring those to light and to try to do justice to the Salvadorans who worked, I've worked with over the past 17 years. Um, to honor the perseverance, the determination, the patience, the strength, and their, their faith in face of tremendous adversity. Uh, so that's really why I set out to do this study. And I really hope that both in this presentation and in whatever written comes out of it, that I can do justice to that narrative and to the many narratives that make up kind of the narrative of Salvadorans in DC. Um, so let's begin. And let's begin, not chronologically, but let's begin with the early Salvadorans in DC. Right? Now we can trace this all the way back to even the late 19th century, right? Early 20th century. But when we talk about the foundation for Salvadorans in DC, there's always the question of what about the Intipuqueños, right? Because Intipuca looms large in the history of the Salvadoran population in Washington, DC. So we'll start with this small town called Intipuca, which many of you may recognize, maybe some of you are from there, that has taken on epic proportions by now, right? It has become almost a myth, mythologized, right? In migration lore about what's happened with Intipuca and how Intipuqueños came to Washington, DC. And so for this, Janet, if we could if we could go to the next slide of Sigfredo yeah. Chavez. Yeah, just a Sigfredo. Okay. And this lore, the myths, right, and the reality of the, the tale of Antipoqueños centers often begins on the persona of Sigfredo Chavez, right? Who also has taken kind of a mythical standard. Lots of different stories about how he came to the United States, but it's generally perceived and accepted that when he was about 28 years old, he came to the United States about 1966, after having heard from a friend about job opportunities in Washington, DC. Uh, he arrived in Washington, DC, worked as a dishwasher in Bethesda for several months and returned back home to Intipuca after several months flush with cash. And that began, in short order, quite a pipeline that brought hundreds and then thousands of Intipuqueños and their relatives and their relatives and their relatives' relatives to the Washington, D.C. area. So that by 1979, there were approximately 1,000 Intipuqueños in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area which is a lot for a small town in El Oriente in, in El Salvador, right? A lot of the Intipoqueños ended up in Mount Pleasant, which is where Sigfredo Chavez lived, Adams Morgan. And then they branched out quite quickly into Maryland and Virginia. Uh, and they laid the foundation for thousands who would come after, right? From not just Intipuca, but Chirilagua, right? In fact, now we have a Chirilagua, Virginia that has been around for years, another name for Arlandria, Virginia. From San Miguel, La Union, right? The Departamentos de San Miguel, La Union, and all the tiny towns and all the larger cities from those, from El Oriente, right? And that's how we get, that's the, in terms of the majority of the population of Salvadorans in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area are from El Oriente. Right? And that's often been, uh, chalked up to the oversized um, role of Sigfredo Chavez and those who came after him, um, Fernando Leonso, etc. So in Tipuqueños, were th are still thoroughly enmeshed in the fabric of Washington, D.C., right? They are the founding members of many communities. Um, just in Mount Pleasant, uh, and maybe some of you, some of you are already quite aware, if you go to Arcelias, Pupusaria, on the corner of Irving and Mount Pleasant Street, that's owned by Intipuqueños. Uh, El Tamarindo, which has been around for decades in Adams Morgan and Florida Avenue. Uh, Betty Reyes is from 
in Tipica, the Golden Scissors, a well-known hair salon on Mount Pleasant Streets, Alex's hair salon. Rosibela Arbaiza. Mm -hmm. Very so, organized. Y es la que maneja las embajadoras de Intipuca. Exacto, right? Como Hugo Salinas y todos. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's been a quite a, a very strong connection between Intipuca and Washington, D.C., and the pipeline continues, right? So that was established really in the 1960s and flourished in the 1970s and then became even more so after the Civil War broke out in the 1980s. But in Tipoqueños, we're not the first Salvadorans to come to Washington, D.C., right? In terms of a significant number, there, there were a significant number, but even before in Tipoqueños came, Ntipukenos joined Central Americans, including Salvadorans, who were already here, who were domestic workers, right? Because Washington, D.C., after World War II, really sprouted into an international city. Before World War II, Washington, D.C. was seen as kind of a, a little backwards regional. It was a capital, the capital of the United States, but in terms of the city itself, it was still very, a very regional city with regional industry. But after World War II, a lot of embassies began relocating and planting themselves in DC, specifically on 16th Street, including many embassies from Latin America. And at the same time, we see this influx of international elites to staff international lending and finance and development organizations that sprung up after World War II the World Bank, right? The International Monetary Fund, the IDB, the continuing presence of the Organization of American States, used to be called the Pan American Union. And these Latin American elites brought along their domestic workers, right? The folks to cook and to clean and to landscape and to care for their children. And these domestic workers mainly came from Central America partly because it was cheaper to fly someone from Guatemala or from El Salvador, from Honduras to Washington, D.C. than it was to fly someone from Buenos Aires to Washington, D.C. to care for your children, right? These were mainly women, predominantly, almost exclusively, but not exclusively. And they cooked and they cleaned and they cared for the families of these diplomats and international financiers. They settled in Adams Morgan, often in more modest apartments, and they often remained in DC after their employers left. Or they escaped their employers because their employers were incredibly oppressive, uh, with the help often of the Catholic Church, including now Cardinal uh, Sean O'Malley of Boston, who engineered, who would send nuns into the embassies to rescue the help and then he had safe houses in Mount Pleasant where he would put them up. He is now one of the Pope's right-hand men, you know, but he cut his teeth in Mount Pleasant at the Spanish Catholic Center. So many of these domestic workers took advantage of U.S. immigration laws preference for family members, and they brought their immediate families, who then brought their immediate families. And we have by this time, what is typified as chain migration, which has gotten a bad name, but in which in, in effect is a very effective way for people to bring their families to the United States. So by the time that the Salvadoran revolution broke out in earnest, right? By the time the final offensive in 1980, which actually ended up being the first offensive of the FMLN came in the, uh, in 1980, the Salvadorans had established a beachhead in the DC metro area. And there were about 30,000 Salvadorans in the Washington DC metropolitan area by the time civil war broke out in earnest in 1980, right? Several months after the, the assassination of Monsignor Romero. Now, as you can expect, the Salvadoran civil war, witnessed a massive boom in DC's Salvadoran population, right? Within a few years, the DC metropolitan area was second only to Los Angeles in its population of Salvadorans. 
But the question is, why? Right? Why go to DC? It's cold here. Compared to LA, compared to Miami, compared to Texas, it's freezing cold here, right? Especially up here if you're coming from El Salvador, right? This is not a place, you're, you're not looking for a place with tons of snow. It didn't have much snow anyways, but you're, this, is, this is not a place that would inherently draw Salvadorans. So why come to DC? The answer lies in economics for some part of it, right? To some extent. The DC metropolitan area in the 1980s was incredibly prosperous. DC was booming, right? Especially the suburbs. As whites fled the city, set up the suburban houses, they needed people to build those houses, right? There were more entry level service jobs that paid better than any other large city in the country in the 1980s and into the 1990s, right? So if you had fled El Salvador and you got to LA and you might've tried to get a job in LA, but you, maybe you tried to get a job in an in industry, in the garment industry, the Mexicans had the garment in industry, right? They had control over that. You had to compete with the Mexican population for, for the garment industry. But if you went to DC, you did not have to compete with the Mexican population. DC had no ethnic population that controlled any industry at this time. So not only did Washington DC have better paid entry level jobs, whether they're domestic work, whether they're restaurant jobs, whether they're construction, but they also had no other large ethnic group that dominated the economy. And so Salvadorans could move quite easily in to these entry-level jobs, it wouldn't be pushed out by, any, by other ethnic groups from Latin America. DC was booming. It led the nation in the 1980s in income, in education levels. It had more scientists and engineers per capita than any other metropolitan area in the United States. Wow. DC was a magnet for wealth, for influence, and for power as never before, not even in the 70s, right? So the 1980s was a boom time, especially for the suburbs in, the, in DC. So if you, if you, we go to the next slide, we'll see a picture of the I-66 corridor. Okay? In 19, the 1980s, the I-66 corridor was just being built. Down old farms to get into Loudoun County, right? The rolling hills of what's now the exurbs in Loudoun County. And all that development along the I-66 corridor. And in the next slide up to the I-270 corridor, right? The tech corridor in I-270. All that was happening in the 1980s and 1990s. And as this suburban sprawl was happening, you needed workers to build those roads, to build those highways. You needed workers to build those high-rise offices. All those defense contractors who were relocating to the DC area, they needed, they needed buildings. All that biotech, they needed centers. They needed landscapers to meticulously arrange the shrubs. They needed restaurants to serve all their new employees who had a lot of money. They needed nannies. These employees wanted nannies to take care of their children. So this gave, the, in terms of the demand for entry-level positions, service industry positions, the demand was huge. And the supply, the demand outstripped the supply. And that's what really attracted lots of Salvadorans to Washington, DC. It was one of the best places in the country for what we would call unskilled, which is in my mind, uh, very skilled, right? Service-oriented jobs. And so Salvadorans flocked to Washington, D.C. metropolitan area by the thousands. Right? Some settled in the historically Latino barrios, right? Adams Morgan, Mount Pleasant, a little bit in Columbia Heights. Increasingly, they settled further out in the suburbs. And so within a couple of years, you see Arlington, Virginia, Alexandria, Virginia, Silver Spring, Maryland, Langley Park, Maryland, Hyattsville, Maryland. These had become safe havens for Salvadorans who were fleeing the Civil War. Places like Arlandria, right? 
uh, was essentially a reconstituted Chirilagua, San Luis. I used to teach um, English to a lot of the maintenance workers at Georgetown my first few years there. And I was talking with one of my students and I, she said, I said, where do you live? Like in the DC area. And she said, oh, you'll be on Chirilagua. I said, well, that, that's, that's nice. You know, I've been to Chirilagua, El Salvador. Like, where, where do you live in, in D.C.? And she says, no, vivo en Chirilagua, Virginia. I said, oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then I had to go back and look it up. And sure enough, right? <laughs> and that really drove home the point to me how important these connections are, right? Uh, I was also... It was kind of funny. I was I was in um I was at the UCA in uh, in El Salvador in 2005 doing some research in the archives, and I had a helper, a junior, senior in college, very nice, super friendly, sociology major. He was helping me get the archival documents I needed, and we had fiestas Augustinas, so the UCA closed. I went to Guatemala to visit a friend who was in Guatemala City at the time. Is Guatemala, and then I came back a week later, and I was chatting with my assistant, and I said, "Well, how was your vacation?" He said, "Oh, it was great. Where'd you do?" I said, "I went to Guatemala. You know, I hung out with my friend. What'd you do?" He said, "Ah, uh, yo fui a uh, Arlington." <laughs> he said, "He said, uh, yo fui a Arlington, Virginia." And I looked at him and I said, you went to Arlington, Virginia in the same week that I went to Guatemala. Yeah, he said, yeah, I just hung out with my cousins in, you know, Alexandria and Arlington, it was great. And that just blew me away. Um, he hopped on a Taka flight, went to Arlington and that was his spring break or his August break, right? And so stories like those kept coming back and really reemphasizing the importance of what I realized was you can't tell the history of modern El Salvador without talking about migration. And you can't talk about migration without talking about migration to the US. And you can't talk about migration to the US without talking about migration to the Washington DC area. Second most, second largest population of Salvadorans in the United States, third largest in the world. And that's when I really began to pay a lot more attention to these, the ties that bound the two areas. Um, so in the few minutes we have, before we turn over the question and answer, what I'd like to do is touch upon two kind of different topics. I mean, this, the dissertation covers a lot, but I want to zero in on a couple that I think are really, are really important for us to understand, respect, and, and also dig in in terms of the research that needs to be done. During the 1980s, first of all, well, the first one is activism. Right, so that's our broad heading. Um, during the 1980s, most Salvadorans came across the border, surviving if they did the scorching desert, swimming the Rio Grande, strapped to the underside of an 18 wheeler, hiding in trunks of cars. Those who made it found that their status was at least even more difficult and more dangerous than the trip up because they had no documentation because the Ronald Reagan administration in the 1980s had decided that Salvadorans fleeing the civil war were economic migrants, not political refugees, because the United States was funding the Salvadoran government, right? And it couldn't look bad in the eyes of the public by admitting that the people fleeing the country he was funding uh, were refugees and from atrocities, which they were, or many of them, right? But the problem was that most Salvadorans who arrived in the United States uh, were ripe for abuse because those documents did not protect them. Right? Abuse by employers, abuse by police, abuse and deportation by the INS, right? what we now know as ICE, um, Immigration and Naturalization Services. Yet there were also dedicated forces, very dedicated forces that had mobilized in response, recognizing the plight of, of, of these thousands of Salvadorans who are coming both to Washington DC and other parts of the country and who are working tirelessly to protect the vast majority of Salvadorans 
who had arrived without documentation. And these organizations are really, really unique, right? Because they were founded by Salvadorans and by their North American allies. They served the Salvadoran population and the central, other Central Americans as well, Guatemalans in particular, who fled the wars. Uh, but these organizations called themselves not only social service agencies, they went above and beyond. They kind of self-identified as what they would call political humanitarian activists. And these organizations, again, small groups of committed Salvadorans allied with North Americans, really succeeded in putting Salvadorans on the map, both DC and nationally, and also in serving these huge numbers of Salvadorans who are coming and fleeing the war. I think one of the reasons for their success is that they didn't limit themselves to the provision of social services, to the provision of legal services, to offering job opportunities, to healthcare, right? They went above and beyond that. They engaged the broader audiences. They looked at national and international issues. They advocated on the national international scale. Um, they addressed the larger structural issues of why Salvadorans were coming. A couple quick examples. Again, there are, there are plenty more in the thesis, which I will share a link to you. It's, a, it's, a, it's not open access so anybody can access it. So we'll put that up. Uh, if Jenna, if we could put that up in the link somehow, I'll send that to you at the end. Um, but the organizations, uh, one, and let's flip, if we can do the next slide, Jenna, it's look at CARESEN, which is the Central American Refugee Center, yeah. now known as the Central American Resource Center. Mm -hmm. Central American Re CARESEN was founded by uh, Joaquin Dominguez Parada, who had escaped from El Salvador, had come to the United States in DC, had met someone named Patrice Perrill, Perilli, and Patrice was uh, a newly minted lawyer and was working at a local law firm. And they together started CARESEN, right, Central American Refugee Center. And it was mostly a legal organization, thwarted immigrant immigration raids, cultivated relationships on Capitol Hill, brought refugees to testify on Capitol Hill. These refugees shared their stories of persecution. And not, not only did they work to bond, bond out Central Americans at the border and help Central Americans in Washington, D.C., in the surrounding area, but they pushed for immigration reform, right? They were central in the passage of what would be not what we'd be known what we know now as temporary protective status. Caresen and those surrounding Caresen, Caresen, right, the Salvadoran Refugee Committee and others were absolutely essential in advocating and pushing the US Congress and pushing this, the, the issue of temporary protective status that finally was rolled into immigration legislation in 1990. And Salvadorans still play an absolutely essential role in the, in the TPS National Alliance, right? That's advocating for TPS today. Another organization, if we flip to the next slide, is La Clinica del Pueblo. La Clinica del Pueblo, founded by some of those same people who founded Caresen. And in conjunction with, and acknowledgedly, a, a kind of a self proclaimed hippie commune in Mount Pleasant that was called Plenty International who had some pretty great hard skills in terms of medical skills. La Clinica La Pueblo stands as one of the pillars today of effective bilingual Latino healthcare provision. And I'd like to draw you to, I'm sorry, I, think I, I think I probably got a couple quotes. Are those quotes on there, Jeanette? Can you they see are, those? They are, they are. Yeah. Some of my favorite quotes, actually my favorite quote is by Joaquin Dominguez Parada, co-founder of, Care, co of Cares and, and one of the co-founders of La Clinica Pueblo. And I just love that quote, right? And I don't have the quote in front of me. Dice que no es que los gringos no dieron una clínica. Con la ayuda de los norteamericanos hicimos la clínica, nosotros mismos. 
Exacto. Entonces, Joaquín Domínguez Parada y luego Juan Romagosa, que fue muy querido por todos aquí eh, como director, porque él era el médico. Eh, we, we were the artisans of our own project with our own sauce and flavor. Nosotros fuimos los artesanos de nuestro propio proyecto con nuestra propia salsa y sabor, decía el, el, el doctor Romagosa. And I think those two quotes really encapsulate the ethos, right, of La Clinica del Pueblo and of a lot of these organizations that came about, right? These were fundamentally Salvadoran organizations, right? These were at heart organizations that used revolutionary praxis when they started creating these organizations, right? So the Salvadoran revolution had already come to Washington, D.C., right, through these organizations, even though perhaps it wasn't as ostensibly um, obvious per se, right? A lot of the organizing tactics that were used to organize these organizations were, were organizing taxes, tactics taken straight from Salvadoran revolution. Because a lot of the folks who came initially at first were opposition leaders who had fled because their lives were in danger. I'd also, I'd, I'd like to, to bring in one more um, alliance, I'd like to use the word, and that's the sanctuary movement, which is the next few slides. And the sanctuary movement, I think is the epitome, epitomizes uh, kind of a horizontal alliance, right? Between North Americans who are concerned about what their government was doing and Central Americans who were aptly trying to change US policy. Um, and the sanctuary movement was a broad nationwide movement, right? Started in Tucson, Arizona, but spread across the United States. And what many people don't realize was that DC was a hub of the sanctuary movement. In fact, it was one of the most important places for the sanctuary movement in the 1980s. Luther Place Memorial Church, whose pastor was the, the crusading pastor, Reverend John Steinbrook, who's pictured in, I believe, one of those, uh, those yeah. slides. Luther Place Memorial Church was one of the first churches in the country to declare sanctuary to Central American refugees. Luther Place Memorial Church welcomed four or five, I think it was four, four Central Americans, all Salvadorans, as its first sanctuary, in a, into a sanctuary, right? Mm -hmm. As the first refugees. Among them, uh, a young lady who had been separated from her child at the border and then reunited afterwards. Her name was Carmen Monico, and she's in the picture as well. You can't really see her too well because she has her back turned. But Carmen Monico ended up... Uh, staying in DC and taking charge of Crescent, which was the, the Comité uh, for, let's say, the, the Central American Refugee Committee, uh, also known as the Salvadoran Refugee Committee in, in the DC chapter. And Carmen Monico ended up getting her doctorate and is now a professor at Elon University in North Carolina. And her extended family still lives in Washington, DC in Maryland. So these roots stay, right? The sanctuary movement made a tremendous impact, uh, political and at the grassroots level. It changed thousands of minds and hearts, even in the United, even in the in Washington D.C. There are many, many, many uh, communities of worship that partnered with the sanctuary movement, including All Souls Unitarian on 16th Street, Dumbarton United Methodist Church. Which, which gave sanctuary to America Sosa, uh, if you, you recognize that name from the 80s. And Salvadorans, again, played an absolutely crucial role in this, giving testimonials of their experiences of being marginalized, oppressed, harassed, tortured, uh, and run out of their countries. And really by adopting this refugee identity, it allowed Salvadorans to endow themselves with a compelling moral authority that really legitimized these, these testimonies. And it really validated this broader movement. Uh, an extremely important movement that has really been underserved. Uh, Phil Wheaton, a towering figure on the Latin American left, the religious left, I believe is in one of those as well. 
Um, what slide are we on? We are Dakota? in Pastor Steinbrook and uh, deal with four Central American refugees. So we're okay. right there. So now What's, we move to Mount Pleasant riots. Okay. Yes. Is that what we've got next? Yes, we do. We don't have that much time. We will just spend the next five minutes and then we will open up for questions. <laughs> yes. There is much more in this study, as you can see. I could talk on and on. But what we'd like to turn to now is the, actually the title of this presentation, right? Or the, the bombs that drop in El Salvador explode in Mount Pleasant. I take no credit for this. This is actually a quote. It's a quote from Frank Smith, who at that time, and when he said it, which was in 1986, a very prescient quote, was the Ward 1 ANC commissioner. In Ward 1, again, encompasses Mount Pleasant and was Morgan, some of Columbia Heights. Frank Smith went on to found the African American Civil War Museum, as the current currently still stands as the director of the African American Civil War Museum. At the time, Frank Smith was talking about the impact of the Salvadoran Civil War on his constituents in Ward 1, right? The number of Latinos was increasing every day. Adams Morgan, Mount Pleasant, Columbia Heights, and then outward. He recognized this intimate connection between aquí y allá, right? Between where he was and his constituency and what was happening with US policy in Central America. And he recognized that in the revolution, right? In El Salvador was coming to Washington DC, whether DC was ready or not. It was quite prescient because in May of 1991, uh, many considered to be the Salvadoran Revolution arrived. I would argue that it came many, many years before that. But I would argue that it had been here all along through solidarity networks, through CSPES, through others closely associated with the Salvadoran armed left. But on the night of May 5th and 6th, 1991, we saw protests and ensuing violence that followed the shooting of a Salvadoran man his name was Daniel Enrique Gomez. Interestingly enough, he was a dishwasher at Georgetown University's cafeteria. And so he was shot by a rookie African-American female police officer who had been on the beat for about a year or two named Angela Jewell. And that shot that rang out through Mount Pleasant uh, and then the kind of rumors and stories that spread after he was shot and as he was lying on the pavement bleeding, really rocked DC, right? And it forced DC to acknowledge a population that city officials and even DC longtime residents had dismissed. What followed the shooting was a coordinated assault by Latino youths, predominantly but not exclusively Salvadoran, on the night of May 5th, in directed retaliation for the years of abuse that Latino youth had suffered at the hands, at the batons, of the DC police, of the Metropolitan Police Department. Verbal harassment, physical harassment, brutality, threats, right? All things we would associate now with what we call the over-policing of communities of color, especially with the war on drugs in the 1980s. These youths took to the streets, they taunted police, they threw rocks, they threw bottles, they threw bricks, they set police cars afire, they even set a paddy wagon afire, flame, right? And they used methods learned on the streets in San Salvador, right, to fight against the Salvadoran police. And they turned right around and used those against the, their oppressors in Washington, D.C. By the second night, the protests and the looting that followed the second night had attracted youth from all over the city. So this became a multiracial affair. It wasn't just brown, it was black and it was white as well, some kind of sprinklings of white. And ironically, the second night right, of violence really kind of exploded into Adams Morgan and into Columbia Heights, but it provided this opportunity for marginalized racial minorities, particularly brown and black minorities, whose relationship had up until this point really been scarred by hostility and misunderstanding and cultural misunderstanding to forge some common ground over what I would argue is shared economic grievances. Now, after the second night, things calmed down a bit with the help of curfew, massive police presence, not a small amount of tear gas. We saw sporadic outbreaks of violence, but the damage was done. The bombs that dropped in El Salvador had exploded full force in Mount Pleasant. There's plenty of, of other things to talk about on this topic in particular. I can refer you to the 
the document that I'll share, the doctoral thesis. There's also a great documentary that's being made right now because this is the 30th anniversary of the Mount Pleasant uprisings. Um, a young documentary filmmaker who grew up in Mount Pleasant named Ellie Walton is making a documentary about the 1991 uh, uprising, which is which I would encourage you to watch once she releases it later this year. However, what I'd like to end with really is the importance of the Mount Pleasant uprisings, disturbances, riots. And that really forced the District of Columbia to, Columbia to acknowledge the plight of Salvadorans, right? It brought an often fractious Latino leadership together. They were determined to leverage these disturbances to wring concessions from the city's new mayor, Sharon Pratt Dixon. But in the end, they were thwarted by, I would say, structural issues uh, in terms of resources, an entrenched political establishment, a massive DC bu budget deficit, cuts in social services under president, Republican presidents, a bloated DC bureaucracy. Yet, in many ways, even though we didn't see any significant massive structural changes after the Mount Pleasant riots of 1991, these disturbios had left their mark on the District of Columbia. They thrust Salvadorans on a center stage in a performance that never could be really erased and never could be forgotten. And throughout the years, since then, Salvadorans have managed to legitimize their presence, to advocate for the rights, and to build new lives in the nation's capital. And really in doing so, putting an indelible stamp, a Salvadoran stamp, on the social and political institutions and the cultural landscape of the Washington DC metropolitan area. I will leave it there. I'm one minute over, my sincere apologies. <laughs> This is wonderful, Patrick. Thank you very much. There's some, there's some questions here that I think uh, people are making comments and I thought you would want to hear. Excellent. Uh, uh, uno es de parte de Vladimir Monge, dice, el salto de organizaciones de base dirigidas por activistas e instituciones financiadas por la ciudad hizo que algo se perdiera en la conexión de estas organizaciones con la comunidad. El hecho de que empezó en la comunidad, pero cuando ya empieza el gobierno a financiarlas, hay un distanciamiento entre la, la base ¿no? y las organizaciones. ¿Qué piensas sí, hay. de eso? ¿Ah? Sí, hay, sí, hay. Y depende en qué, en qué década, ¿no? En los 70 uh, había más organizaciones de base. En, en, estamos hablando sobre Washington, D.C., ¿no? All right. Había más organizaciones de base de comunidad eh, en los 70 por la necesidad, ¿no? Por la necesidad de creer una vida latina, ¿no? Una comunidad latina. Durante los 80 el gobierno de, de Washington, del distrito, Marion Barry y sus jefes políticos, Empezaron a, a dar más dinero, más fondos a los agencias, las agencias latinas en, en, en Washington. Y después, poco a poco, sí se veía una, una distancia, que sí, había más y más distancia entre lo, las comunidades, las agencias de la comunidad y los que estábamos sirviendo, ¿no? A la, a la gente, a la gente a la que gente. se... Así es. Eh, eh, porque Vladimir dice, el primer flujo de inmigrantes salvadoreños en los 80 y 90 incluía muchos activistas sociales. Sí, Que exacto. se habían entrenado en movimientos revolucionarios. Exacto. Las características del levantamiento de Mount Pleasant lo demostraron. Es lo uh -huh. que está totalmente de acuerdo con tu análisis de cómo pasó eso, ¿verdad? Sí. So you're in, in full agreement with what happened, in, in essence, by saying that Salvadorans, the leadership really came with a history uh, uh -huh. of, of being involved in the process in the revolutionary movement in Salvador. Yeah. But what I'd like to say is that that leadership and kudos to them, to their, to their um, 
so they're, I guess I, I would say that because they were able to turn right around and say, no, these organizations we are creating are for everyone, right? This was, these were organizations, you know, people would come from to Cares and, and you would have former ejército, right? You would have people who were from the Salvadoran army who would come to Cares and Cares would say, yes, we'd serve you as well, right? So these were organizations that were founded by leaders of the opposition primarily, but who then turned around and served, not, were not exclusive in the populations they served. They served everybody, which I think is to really to their credit um, in, in what they set out to do. That's not to say that they did not sacrifice their ideological components, right? Because La Clinica del Pueblo is still out in the streets advocating for an end to US military aid, right? Carecen was still out in the streets, but Carecen and La Clinica served everyone. And I think, and that's, I think that's the important balance that we have to understand about these organizations. Yes, and, and also, I mean, there were other organizations that, whether it's a Latin American Youth Center or, you know, Centronia, all of these organizations were serving all of the Latino community, not just Salvadorans. And so you see, you know, a combination of leadership that's Salvadoran and leadership that is Latino, U.S. born Latino and from other countries. And as well as, uh, you know, just, just concerned U.S. citizens who were engaged in this, you know. Um, uh, it, it's, um, if you were to say, what were the contributions of Salvadorans to the DC area? What would you say? What would be your first gut reaction as to the contributions? Tantos. Um, I mean, we can talk about cultural contributions, right? We can talk about cuisine. We can talk about food. That's easy to do. I think what's harder to do is talk about the contributions that were made by Salvadorans who came with nothing, who started their own businesses, including restaurateurs, right? And who have been wildly successful in creating businesses, uh, small businesses in, in particular, that have really kept the remittance economy afloat, right? And so I would say the combination in terms of, I mean, what, what people who come to DC say, oh yeah, there's a Salvadoran restaurant here. Oh yeah, there's a, you know, there's a pupusaria here. Oh yeah, we have, you know, that's what they feel, right? Oh yeah, I can buy my, my mangos on the street, right? But if you if you peel that, if you peel off a few layers, I think the contribution of Salvadorans to the economy of Washington, DC has been immense. And I think that the the problem is that the side is that for a number of different reasons, Salvadorans haven't been able to capitalize upon that politically, right? But the economic contribution, the small businesses that were created and they continue, the small businesses that grew into big businesses, the import export businesses, the construction businesses, the people who started off as bricklayers who now own these construction businesses, that's, that's been, been re what's, what's really, really impressed me. Um, and so I would, I would, I would say that's, that's one of the big things that I point to that often people don't recognize. One of the things Rodrigo Contreras says, do you have an opinion on the major political tendencies of current Salvadorans in DC? I will. So one of the things, Rodrigo, that I, that I have to do is to maintain some, of, some legitimacy and objectivity, uh, even though I'm, I have my arguments, is that I, I, I have to talk to everybody, right? Um, my opinions on the political tendencies today, I don't have strong opinions on how Salvadorans lean, right? I know that when Nayib Bukele was, um, uh, was campaigning, he came to Washington DC several times, right? He was well received and he was lathered with donations, right? So people dumped money, threw money at him. I can't tell you whether now that has changed, right? Seeing his increasingly authoritarian tendencies. Um, I don't ask people when I interview them, I don't ask them about their political affiliation because I, that is not the focus of what I do, right? Uh, if they happen to mention it, then great. Um, but 
because I've stuck, because my research has mostly been in the 1980s and 1990s, I, I tend to leave the present alone for that very reason, because I don't want to isolate anybody uh, by, you know, uh, my con, I don't want my, want, don't want my comments to isolate anybody. I, so I, I don't have as, to answer your question, I don't have as strong opinions on, and I don't have my, my finger on the pulse of where Salvadorans in the DC metropolitan region are politically. I can tell you that in the 1980s and 1990s, they tended to, to swing towards arena, right? So they tended to be much more conservative socially and culturally. And that is because the vast majority came from El Oriente and that is a politically and culturally very conservative part of El Salvador. Well, one of the things uh, Vladimir Monge says, sadly, the Latino Center for Civil Rights created by the Mount Pleasant uprising just dissipated over time and there is no relevo de los líderes. No, eso es, yeah, this is, so yes, uh, it did hang around, I would say to its credit for quite, so for several years after, right? Some of these, the DC Latino Civil Rights Task Force is what um, the, he's referring to. And the DC Latino Civil Rights Task Force, which was headed by Pedro Aviles, at the beginning and for a few years after, and then um, different people took over the directorship. It did advocate for the rights of Latinos as a whole in Washington, DC, um, and was effective, was marginally effective, and even more, mar more than marginally effective at promoting some changes within the police structure um, and within the, the government. You're right, there isn't, the, it didn't last. Um, often these things don't last. Uh, it lasted actually longer than I would expect it to last. It lasted into the mid, mid 1990s, um, which is several years after one expects these things to last, right? The question is, that took up the mantle from the Council of Hispanic Agencies, right? Uh, being the La, La Voz de los Latinos in, in Washington, D.C. Nothing really took up the mantle from that, right? And that, that is what we see a, kind of a a vacuum of power really uh, that has yet to be filled in the leadership of the Latino community. If we can even call it the Latino community because it's so big now, right? And it was always fractious. It was always factions, right? They're always tit for tat, right? So it's, um, they sp it spoke with, with arguably one voice for an admirable number of years after, the, after 1991. But the question is in the 2000s, you're absolutely right. Um, we see, uh, we don't see any political power figures uh, who have risen up. And that's, again, there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, I just want to say that uh, thank uh, Rodrigo Contreras, eh, Roberto Ernesto Jovel Barrera, Nancy Gutierrez, Ana Gan eh, Granielo, Hilda Parducci, Al Barrera, Miguel Angel Chinchilla, eh, que han estado con nosotros, Sandy Castro, Ricardo Bayón, Sonia Spom, eh, eh, y Vladimir Bonge, Federico Talavera, Loli Segueda dice, en Orlando, Florida, there are organizations supporting Puerto Ricans to prepare them to run for political positions. Do Salvadorans have this support? The, the short answer is no. Uh, and there is a number of different reasons for that. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the fact that Puerto Ricans have been in, if we compare the two, Puerto Ricans have been in Florida for quite some time and for several generations, right? We're still looking at the second and third generations of Salvadorans here. They're starting to be that way, right? The other thing is that you had a Latino presence in Florida for decades and decades and decades, right? right? And in Washington, D.C., if we look at the bid, the long span, the Latino presence in Washington, D.C. is still rather young, right? It's only about 50, 60, 70, 60, six decades or so, seven decades, right, in earnest. And so it takes a while to build that up. It takes a while to build those organizations. It also takes money. And this is where I really think that in the next 20 or 30 years, you're going to see these organizations start to, start to bubble up. So right now there, there aren't many organizations that will that are focused specifically on Central Americans or Salvadorans in particular, 
but I really do hope that they are in the future. My hope lies with those second and third generations who are very politically active and incredibly politically engaged. Well, um, I am delighted that we have had this conversation and very thankful, Patrick, for giving us an overview of Los Salvadoreños and Washington, D.C. And um, I just want to give you an opportunity to, to say, uh, uh, to, to, to tell us where we can find your thesis because it's uh, uh, so that people can um, benefit access. from the research. Absolutely. So it's open access. And what I, would, what I can do is I can share the link with you. Okay. If you want to share the, if you want to share the link on the website yes. with the network, do you have that? Uh, you can share it directly. You you have access to to link yourself there. Okay, let me. It's pretty easy to access. If you just if you just Google the bombs that drop in El Salvador, it'll be the first thing that pops up. Um, and that will be, and it's, it's, it's open access to everyone. Um, so you can access it. It's through the George, it's at the Georgetown University Library. But what I will do is also see if I can copy and paste the link in so that everyone can see it. Yeah, um, we can't see it here. We, we can't see you, it. Okay, so, if, but if you just Google the bombs that drop in El Salvador, then it will be, then it's, it's pretty easy to access. Let me see if I can post in the chat. Uh, and that I would have to. Um, here we go, it's in the chat. Okay, uh, this, I then I copy, just a minute. And there's plenty of more information as well that's, that's being done by other excellent scholars on this, on this particular topic. Um, so I'd encourage you to, to look through the bibliographical information as well, uh, list a lot of studies of El Salvador. So it is a transnational study, um, but oh, there we go. Okay. I'm going to leave it so that people can actually look at it and be able yeah. to, to read it. And um, uh, yeah. well, I just uh, I wanted to thank you. And I want to say that um, uh, Maria Angel Villalobos uh, has been watching it. And she's very thankful for your presentation. Antonio Albendaris también, verdad? Uh, and it's the researchers, the young Central Americans are very excited that you are actually uh, writing the history of Salvadorans and, and uh, of the organizations founded by Salvadorans and the impact that they've had. Yes, and, that's, and it's important for us to remember that this, these are Salvadoran organizations. They could not have come about without the help of US allies. But these are at their very core Salvadoran organizations that were founded on revolutionary praxis, right? Um, and that's that's I think a testament to some of the ideals of the Salvadoran Revolution that still are, are around today. Well, very good. Uh, I want to thank you, Patrick, very much for this presentation, and I look forward to reading the whole book. Absolutely, I think that. Um, it's, uh, it's a sense of belonging and a sense of pride of what uh, Salvadorans have done in DC and are continuously doing. I think that uh, gentrification has pushed a lot of Salvadoran community out of DC. So the history in the future will not be the same because the immigrant that arrives here cannot afford to live in Washington, D.C. Yep. And until D.C. has affordable housing, we're going to be bleeding our populations into the suburbs, and it will dissipate the possibility of having more political power when you don't have population behind it. 
and service organizations behind it. So I think that many of the service organizations, whether it's Mary Center or La Clinica and, and others have moved to the suburbs, you know, mm -hmm. and they have outshoots over there because the community can afford to live there and cannot afford to live in DC. So I think that um, there are institutions, whether it's uh, Carlo Rosario International Charter School that has been a key place for Salvadorans uh, adults and has taught English and has served over 50,000 people throughout its history of immigrants. And so, you know, whether it's Bell Multicultural, Latin American Youth Center, or the church in uh, all the churches, especially Sacred Heart, right there in the heart of the community, they really have been key and important to, to be able to stabilize in a place of welcoming to Salvadorans, and yes. undoubtedly, but, you know, there's still a lot to be done to be able to get the Salvadoran culture and uh, leadership uh, recognized in the city. And so we you want- guys are, You guys are doing an outsized role in that, in La Casa de la Cultura. <laughs> well, I wanna thank you very much, Patrick, for your uh, generous time and, and uh, all of those uh, years that you have spent interviewing hundreds of Salvadorans about why they came, how they came, and their process of, of adapting to the society. So thank you very much. It's a great contribution for Salvadorans who we are now international and domestic. We are intermestic, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it has been a pleasure and an honor um, to be able to do so over the past few years. And I just, I hope I can do their stories justice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank everyone. Muchísimas gracias a todos por estar con nosotros esta noche y agradecerles. Y acuérdense que una sociedad que no escribe su historia, otros van a escribir por ella. Y qué bien que ahora tenemos por lo menos una base de datos importante de las vidas de estos salvadoreños aquí en Washington, porque el impacto que ellos han tenido en El Salvador es profundo, además de en Washington DC. Muchísimas gracias a todos, muy buenas noches, y seguimos como siempre eh, dando eh, eh, charlas sobre historia, cultura y arte, manténganse en en Facebook Casa de la Cultura El Salvador y esperamos verlos pronto. Mañana seguimos con literatura, el jueves también y el viernes seguimos aprendiendo sobre el Estado salvadoreño. Y el 21, el Bicentenario, de nuevo con el doctor Héctor Lindo. Así es que los esperamos. Muchísimas gracias, Patrick. Buenas noches a todos y hasta pronto. Gracias. Gracias a ustedes.